What comes to mind when I ask you to picture someone outdoorsy? What do they look like? What are they doing? Maybe you pictured a friend who would love to spend every weekend in the mountains. Maybe you pictured someone who could be in the website or catalog for an outdoor gear company. Maybe you pictured yourself. Did you? I'm a pediatrician, researcher, and mother, and none of those titles sound particularly outdoorsy. And for the longest time, I didn't think of myself as outdoorsy. But now, now I do. And that's my point. I want to challenge prevailing notions of what it means to be outdoorsy. Why? Because being outdoors, especially in nature, is good for our health and our well being. So all of us not only need access to the outdoors, but we need to feel like we belong there. We need to get to a point where outdoor experiences are not considered a luxury reserved for a few, but rather something that each of us needs and deserves. Let me explain by taking you back to my childhood. So I was born in India and spent most of the first 10 years of my life in a pretty urban area in the city of Lucknow. I never went hiking there. I don't remember ever being in the woods. And I don't think I even knew what camping meant. In fact, my relatives would have laughed at the idea that people with resources would choose to sleep on the ground and pee in the woods. But here's what I did do. So we lived on a second story apartment with my grandparents and we had a rooftop terrace. And I spent a lot of time up there. In the winters, we would just sit up there to soak up the sun. And in the summertime, when it was too hot to be indoors, we would set out cots and sleep under the stars. And the downstairs neighbor had a guava tree and it reached the second story. So if I stood in just the right spot in our living room window, I could reach out and have ripe guava an arm's length away. I remember spending after schools and summer times just wandering from rooftop terraces to front yards. We rarely played indoors. And I have slept on that terrace more than a hundred times. Once my family moved to the US, we did start to visit parks. We usually went with friends and family and there was always food involved. You know, Tupperware containers of Indian snacks and a thermos full of chai for the adults. And when our family went to Acadia National Park, our rice cooker, of course, came with us. Now, my parents may not be folks that you picture as outdoorsy, but let me tell you, they are. In the summer and the winter, the rain and the snow, they walk outdoors almost every single day. And we were always outdoors. But of course, we didn't have any special gear, no special shoes or backpacks, and definitely no tents. I don't think we knew anyone who had tents back then. Once I got to college and beyond, I did meet people who knew about hiking and camping. And once my husband and I moved to the Pacific Northwest, we met so many wonderful people who shared their outdoor experiences with us and took us along to some of them. I think of those friends as nature mentors and nature allies. So a nature mentor is someone who is an experienced, trusted guide. They might give you tips, lend you some gear, and maybe even bring you along on an excursion you wouldn't have tried on your own. I think of a nature ally as someone who's a reliable supporter and just makes it more likely that both of you will get outdoors. And because of the nature mentors and nature allies in my life, I've now tried sailing and skiing. I've gone backpacking at Glacier National Park, and I've even camped at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Sure, I was a little hesitant to try all of these initially, but with a little bit of courage and a lot of support, I'm so glad I did. And then two years ago, we got to take my original nature mentors, my parents, on their very first camping trip. I mean, it was glamping, but I think that's close enough. Now, time outdoors took on additional significance once I became a mother. I noticed that my children and others who would get in trouble sometimes for moving around too much in classrooms could actually be engaged and behave nicely when they were allowed to move their little bodies and they could run and jump and climb. I felt like being outdoors was also good for their development. So just imagine when a child climbs a tree or a large rock and the challenges they encounter compared to when they're climbing a plastic 
ladder with all the rungs equidistant and predictable. I felt like being outdoors helped them to become more resilient when they encountered wind and wetness and dirt. Their bodies had to take little risks and become used to something that was uncomfortable or a little unpredictable than their temperature controlled indoor environments. And when we planted our very first backyard garden, my children actually ate salad. So I share this with you to emphasize the idea that being outdoorsy can look like so many different things. It can be visiting immense national parks, but it can also be planting a garden. It can be biking or kayaking, and it can also be taking a walk with a loved one. Remember that the nearby nature is, is really important too. So around the time that I really began to appreciate outdoor experiences and the value of them for my life, I read Richard Louv's landmark book, Last Child in the Woods. And in this book, he coins the term nature deficit disorder to describe the increasing disconnection between children today and the natural world and the, and the consequences of this for future generations and for our planet. And you know where I read this book? So we were sitting on a beach with my two little boys playing in the sand, and they were just digging and digging for what seemed like hours, because for the first time in years, I actually read more than one chapter in a sitting of this book. And that was a transformational moment for me, and I was inspired to study this topic more as a child health researcher. So over the last decade, I've led several studies to study and promote movement, physical activity, time outdoors and time in nature through preschools, schools, clinics, and communities. And a few years ago, some colleagues and I decided that we wanted to systematically review all of the existing scientific literature on nature contact and children's health. So we combed through hundreds of studies and, and published our findings. And the list of benefits of outdoor time for children and adults is long, and it includes things like healthier vitamin D levels, healthier weight status, better concentration for those with ADHD, lower blood pressure, lower stress. But I'm gonna focus on three that I found had particularly compelling evidence and are public health priorities of our time, physical activity, mental health, and vision. So first, let's talk about physical activity. Did you know that less than one in four children in our country meet the recommendation for 60 minutes a day of physical activity? And as children get older, they become less active and girls tend to become less active than boys. In our literature review, we found over 100 studies that said that when children spend time in nature or even if they live near parks and green space, they're more likely to be physically active. And that's true for adults too. Plus there's this idea of green exercise. So when we run or walk on a trail, for example, compared to a treadmill, the benefits our bodies get are beyond that of the physical exercise. We get benefits to our mental health as well. So let's talk about mental health. In a recent national survey, more than one in three high school students reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless in the past year. That is a crushing statistic, but it resonates with what I'm seeing in my clinic as a pediatrician. I'm seeing more children coming in with mental health concerns now than I have ever in the past 20 years of practicing. And the evidence supports that time in nature for children and for adults helps to improve our mood and decrease symptoms of depression and anxiety. Third, let's talk about vision. So some have predicted that 50% of the world's population will be nearsighted by the year 2050. That is half of us. And while there are many theories for why this prevalence is rising, a central one is this idea that children are spending more time on close range activities like screens and less time outdoors. And there are now studies on thousands of children that have found that if we can increase the amount of time children spend outdoors, say by 40 to 60 minutes, you know, adding recess time or outdoor times before or after school, we might be able to prevent a proportion of those children from becoming myopic or nearsighted and needing contacts, glasses, or corrective surgery. So let's talk about screens. We know our lives are surrounded by screens at home, at school, and workplaces. 
You probably have a screen in your hand or your pocket right now. And while I'm not suggesting that time in nature will prevent or fix all that ails us, I do think that the more that we can move from screen time to green time, the more our bodies benefit. Now, these ideas became even more pertinent during the recent pandemic, when so many of our activities moved outdoors, when we realized that viral transmission was, was less, we were safer when we were outdoors. So during the pandemic, my team and I did a study. We, we surveyed a thousand parents across the country who had children six to 17 years old. And one of the most interesting findings was that the families that reported living within a 10 minute walk to a park, so about half a mile to a park, the parents and the children both reported better mental health and they reported being active together more than the families that didn't have nearby park access. But of course, one third of the people in our country do not have access to a park within a 10 minute walk of their home. And that's 100 million people without easy park access in our country. This is a form of environmental injustice, environmental racism, and a barrier to achieving health equity. And the, the neighborhoods that have more families of color and families with lower household incomes, they tend to be the ones with fewer parks, the parks that are there are smaller and have fewer amenities. And the schoolyards in those neighborhoods also have less green space. Even globally, there are huge disparities in access to parks and green space. So much so that in 2021, the United Nations Human Rights Council declared having access to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment a human right. I hope I've convinced you that equitable access to nature is critical for all of us, but I wanna really emphasize that we also all need to feel like we belong in those spaces. We've probably all experienced a time when we didn't feel like we belong. You know, that awkward outsider feeling in a new group or a social setting. I love this explanation for the differences between diversity, inclusion, and belonging. So. Diversity is when you're invited to the party. You have access. Inclusion is when you're asked for suggestions for the playlist. So now you have some power, some influence in that setting. But belonging, belonging is when you can dance like nobody's watching. When you can bring your full authentic self to a situation, you really feel like you belong there. And I think we're much more likely to go back to places when we have that sense of belonging. I shared my story with you to highlight the idea that our experiences with the outdoors really shape the way we feel about outdoor experiences and, and our feeling of belonging there. But there are people who may have physical limitations or health conditions that make the outdoors less accessible to them. There may be others that have a personal family or community history of trauma that occurred outdoors, making them feel less welcome and less safe in outdoor spaces. And finally, there are differences in what each of us might find joyful or restorative about outdoor experiences. Let me give you an example. So those of you that believe that being in nature is only about silence and solitude, have not met my friends and family. So imagine 30 or more people gathered around a campsite. There's music playing, there are games. It's a little chaotic, it's loud. But we're just enjoying each other's company under the trees and under the stars. There are some elaborate meals being cooked and of course, there are always s'mores. Sure, there are moments of silence and solitude and a respect for quiet hours. But we've talked about how sometimes we don't quite feel like we fit in or we're always on a quest for the furthest campsite away from others just to feel a little bit more comfortable. What if our vision for who enjoys nature and how could be broader, more inclusive? What if our outdoor public spaces were accessible and welcoming to all of us? So I'm honored to be speaking to you today on Earth Day. 
and want to remind us that we have a reciprocal relationship with the natural world. We are much more likely to care about the natural world if we feel connected, if we have that sense of belonging. Today is also National Park Prescription Day, meant to promote and celebrate that connection between parks and our health. So as a doctor, I'm gonna leave you with three prescriptions to foster a sense of belonging in nature. One, be a nature ally. Think of who you can reach out to, a friend, coworker, family member, and make a plan to go outdoors together this week. It can be simple, a walking meeting or a visit to the park. Two, if you are in a position in your personal or professional life to inspire, empower, advocate for outdoor experiences for others, please do. You might get someone or even a whole group to start to feel that sense of belonging in the outdoors. And three, think of ways to incorporate more green time into your life. In whatever way and at whatever dose works for you, even in 10 or 20 minute increments, you might be surprised at what you can do and what you enjoy. Because I believe that each of us could see ourselves as outdoorsy. Thank you.